All right. Welcome back, everyone, to what is now Summer Shadowing. Um, this is going to be the first one that we have for the summer. And uh, I'm happy to introduce all of you back to another virtual shadowing session at Hearts for Health. Today, we're joined by Dr. Brombot. A little background behind him. He's a board-certified urologic surgeon and co-founder of the Drive for Men's Health. Dr. Brombot is a TEDx speaker, on-air health expert, top 40 under 40, and recipient of numerous patient choice awards. So we're excited to hear about a new specialty today, and um, we received a lot of interest, so I'm glad to be kicking off our summer with this shadowing session. As a quick reminder for those who might be new to virtual shadowing or to our program in general, um, we have a Q&A saved towards the end, so you'll see that there's a chat box feature where you can write in your questions, type them in, and we'll go through them at the very end of the session during the Q&A. And uh, for those who want to stay updated with future shadowing sessions, we're going to be having them now, Mondays, Thursdays, and sometimes we might have them on other days of the week. Um, it really depends, but for now, Mondays and Thursdays, that's a change from our earlier Thursday schedule. Just keep that in mind. We're going to be posting those on two platforms, our Instagram page, and you can follow us at, at hearts underscore four underscore health, or feel free to um, join our listserv by subscribing over the subscription form at the bottom of our website. So that's really all. If you are not sure exactly how to subscribe, feel free to shoot us an email. Our email is shadowing, period H, the number 4H at gmail.com. Either way works. Uh, if you want to just stay in the loop, we're um, always trying to make that an accessible and easy path to do. But if you have any other questions, feel free to reach, reach out over email. That's all for the reminders. And I don't want to take up any more of our time. So Dr. Bromba, feel free to take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on today. I uh, always consider it a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to kind of talk about my passion uh, and my life, which is urology, but also to mentor the future generation. So I hope if you haven't already been inspired by some of the other shadowing sessions uh, that are reserved and preserved there on, our, on your YouTube channel, I hope today we can inspire you to continue your interest in healthcare and Hopefully one of you will become my doctor one day in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen or at least try to share it. Um, and I think you see it here now. So uh, this is going to be really weird for me, to be honest with you, because I actually prefer we engage while we're talking because um, I'm used to kind of like just fielding questions. So Michael, if someone does have a question, feel free to stop me from talking. I'd much rather kind of uh, do less of the PowerPoint and more of like, you know, obviously what I do, but also if anyone has any questions, tips or tricks beyond just urology, you know, I don't mind answering those. Um, so that being said, this is me right here. And I want to give a little disclaimer, a little warning. It's kind of like when you watch a movie, there's G rated PG 13, um, PG, uh, NR, which is not rated. So this conversation is about urology. So in the past, you've seen orthopedics and dermatology and primary care. This is urology. So urology requires uh, a certain ability to um, cope with certain visuals. So if you don't like seeing pictures of penises um, or don't like seeing pictures of traumatic things that may have happened to these individuals that I was able to help, then you probably should shut off your live stream and uh, some watch another one. But if you are curious, to see the real behind the scenes, like really come and shadow us and see what we do beyond just the general office stuff. Keep watching. So, ooh, that's probably something you're going to see here in the talk later because I've been asked to do some case presentations. If you're curious to know, that is a foreign body being removed from a urologic organ, which we'll get to later. So that being said, I am a urologist. Uh, Michael has um, introduced me very well. I also say I'm a robotic surgeon because I do do a lot of procedures using the robot, the Da Vinci robot, but I love the last title here, and that should really be on top, is the title of dad. I have three daughters, nine, nine, and 10, so if you do see one of them, I'm not really in my office right now, but I'm in my home office, so if you see like little girls in the back um, trying to distract us or trying to grab something, I apologize in advance. Uh, <laughs> they, they like to disturb me when I'm doing these things, but hey, that's what I am and that's what I'll, I'm proud of. So I've also been a patient. A lot of doctors, you know, can talk the talk, but they've never actually sat in those stretchers and 
felt like what it's to be a patient. So the mid COVID exactly a year and a half ago, I had a kidney stone. Now I knew about that kidney stone for about four years and I just kind of ignored it. I said, all right, I'll, I'll come back another day. I'll come back another day. I probably take care of over a thousand kidney stone patients a year. And I was the one that I ignored the most. Um, so because I've lived through three different surgeries throughout, through the holidays in the middle of COVID and felt pretty much all the pain my patients feel on a daily basis when I'm doing procedures on them, I've become a way better doctor. Uh, so yes, I'm a urologist, but I've also been a patient. So hopefully that perspective is able to help us, you know, really show you the behind the scenes. So let's go to my office, Michael. And you guys, so the office urology, I'll get into a little bit, but urology is, I would say, half office and half OR. So this is where I work. I live in Orlando, Florida. I work at a hospital right outside Orlando. Um, it's South Lake Hospital in Claremont, Florida. I live in Orlando. I can actually see and hear the Disney fireworks from where I live every night. So it's pretty cool to live where people love to vacation. And we have a very cool office. So if you look at most doctor's offices, they're very um, boring, you would say, and there's just kind of like a means to an end. There's not much personality to the office, but we actually, and our office started off with the patient experience first. So less about my efficiency as a physician and flow, but more about how you, if you come and see me in the office, how can we make this a super duper comfortable experience? Especially when some of you are waiting half an hour, sometimes an hour to see me because we're kind of starting to run behind. But you'll see here on the bottom, we have a picture of New York City. So we actually don't have rooms. We actually have gates. So every room is a destination. So it's pretty cool that patients sometimes request different rooms because they want to see what's in the room. All this is really to make the patient feel much more comfortable so that when I am in the room with them, you know, half the hard work is done, which is breaking those barriers. So our office um, uh, is part of a big healthcare system. So one thing for you to know as you kind of progress in your career of going into med school or being in med school and residency, about 70 plus percent of physicians now are employed. So either employed by a big group or employed by a big healthcare system. Very few um, are now in private practice. So I've decided to go the employed route. So I'm in the majority. And in our office, we have three doctors, two nurse practitioners, uh, and we have over 18 plus team members. If you look at the whole organization, there's 25 urologists. So we are three of those 25. If you look at the whole organization in terms of productivity, um, I held the title of being the top producer last year. Now, I don't know if I'll make it this year, but um, you know, volume uh, is definitely something I'm used to seeing a lot of. So what do we see in the office? Well, we take care of general urology. I have a niche specialty in ball paints. If you go to myballcert.com, it's going to come to our website. <laughs> um, and chronic testicular pain has a high incidence out there in the world globally. And so we see a lot of our medical tourism patients, a lot of our patients that come from outside of Orlando and out of state and even sometimes out of country come uh, for us to be able to help them with this for this purpose. So that being said, um, you know, when you do come to the office or what exactly is urology? To be 100% honest with you, I had no clue what urology was. And I'm like, sometimes I sometimes pinch myself about how I even got into urology. When I was in med school at Boston University, I had no clue what urology was. I didn't I just picked urology because a senior of mine told me, hey, you know, if you want an easy pass during your one week rotation, you get to pick two rotations um, beyond just your general surgery rotation. And hey, just pick urology, man. It's easy, chill. You'll go home early. I'm like, oh, sweet. Yes. Uh, so I picked it. Little did I know that um, uh, it is like such a cool specialty that I actually did not go home early. I actually truly enjoyed it. And after just the first day, I was like, dude, this is what I should be doing. Where has urology been my whole life? So what do, what do urologists see? Well, we're going to kind of go over some cases as we kind of go through the cadence of this talk, but I just wanted to kind of show you an example of my week in the office. Now, I'm not just in the office. I also cover the hospital, the emergency room, where I may see more emergent things. I cover the inpatient hospital as well. So there may be things that happen while the patient's in the hospital for something else. And um, I also cover 
consoles that may come in the operating room when another surgeon kind of cuts a urologic thing. So I'm just going to focus on the office, but there's a lot more that happens outside of the office as well. So here we have a 55 year old male. He has a high PSA. PSA is a test we do to screen for prostate cancer. It's a test that most men after the age of 40 or all men after the age of 40 should get at least once a year. If you have a family history, you should do it sooner. This man has trouble urinating and his dad had colon cancer. Hmm. Next, female. Yes, urologists do see women. We have a 35-year-old woman, woman who has recurrent infections. She has blood in the urine and she had a gastric bypass two years ago. Hmm. Why is she seeing me in the office today? Then we have a 28-year-old dude who got dragged in by his now wife. Um, and he's been having pain in his ball, especially the right ball, where he has a little lump for about a year now. He does have a history of a hernia repair when he was a kid, but he's essentially coming in with something that just not does not feel comfortable um, down in the testicular area. Hmm, wonder what he's going to have. And then we have a 75-year-old female, again, female, uh, who has had gross blood in the urine for the past week. She's also lost 20 pounds in the past six months uh, unintentionally, and she's a chronic smoker and swears she's never going to quit smoking, period. So you have young patients, old patients, men, women, all different symptoms uh, that may, that they may come up, come in with um, into our office. So let's take a pause. Now, Michael, if anyone has any questions or anything's popped up, please do ask. Um, yeah, we have one question that has come in. So you mentioned earlier about how being a patient has informed your work and practice as a physician. Now, one student asked, how would you recommend med students or undergrads learn those same lessons without being sick or injured? But I, I, I'm glad you put that at the end. Don't get sick or injured on your own, you know, just so you feel it. I think the best way to find that empathy and find those emotions is do what I do, where every person I see I think of them as my family. So that's my mom, that's my dad, that's my sister, that's my cousin, that's my uncle that I may not like, but I'm still gonna take care of them like family. So if you think of it that way, you will not um, kind of sway away from what's evidence-based. You're not gonna do things just for money. Um, when you do that way, you're always gonna kind of follow your gut and your instincts and do the right thing. And when you do it that way, you're gonna have that empathy just naturally. So it's very hard, I mean, to be honest with you, like I did all this stuff before I got sick and I thought I was pretty good at it. Uh, but afterwards I've gotten better, but to be honest with you, I've gotten better more at explaining what these patients are going to go through. And I think I could have learned that a little bit better if, if this didn't happen to me, if I just really listened to the patient when they had complaints and not just say, okay, take your medicine, medicine, medicine. So you can definitely, if you truly listen to the patient, and what they're saying and ask them questions beyond what they're here for um, and try to learn from their experiences, you're going to be able to accomplish the same. So within urology, I'm going to kind of take a step back. I know I mentioned some things about urology, but let's, let's take a moment to kind of really take a deep dive in what urologists do. And I already know what a lot of you are thinking, because this is a question I get a lot is how much do you make Dr. Brombot? Well, we'll kind of go over that in this section as well. So uh, this is a really fun cartoon. I love it. Why are urologists great at sorting out internet connection? They can get anything streaming. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. So this um, is actually in a procedure that we do often. And um, this is me, that fluid that you're seeing spray up is actually fluid that I've evacuated from the scrotum. So this was a hydrocele. So that's when patients have fluid around their testicle. It's formed because of either infection or trauma or just bad luck. And this guy's swelling was so big, he couldn't, he couldn't see his penis, he couldn't pee, he couldn't be sexually active. So we went ahead and drained it and kind of fixed and corrected it. So yes, we do. We can get anything streaming at any time. Uh, I kind of call myself a human plumber. And I think it's a really cool way to describe to patients what you do. And I think it's a cool way for you to understand what we do as well. So we are a surgical subspecialty. Uh, we essentially deal with everything from kidneys down below. Now, some people are like, oh, you're a nephrologist. Hey, dialysis. No, 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 no. We don't get into that boring medical part. We're the surgeons. So in the kidney, we essentially treat anything surgically that can be corrected. 
we don't get into the deep dives of the nephrons and dialysis and all that stuff. We kind of keep it more surgical, but we do work very, very closely with nephrologists, but I don't think I can ever do that because I find that kind of boring. But that being said, uh, I think that comes out of my passion for urology. It's extremely competitive specialty. It's probably, I would say that one of the top five competitive specialties training. Uh, I think the match rate last year for, was about 60%. Um, or even less. So it's extremely competitive. Um, training can take anywhere five, five to seven years, depending on what you're doing for residency. And then if you want to do stuff beyond that, there's a national shortage of urologists. You know, to, to see me right now, if you were to call my office, it's about a 10 to 12 week wait. It's almost three months. And yes, that's because I'm very popular in the area that I'm in. But my partner, it's about six weeks. I mean, it can be a long time before you can see one of us because again, there's a national shortage. Um, and that's because there's just not enough of us. I think there's like 250 or 260 that come out a year. Most patients are referred to us from primary care doctors, and it's a very diverse population. As you saw in some of the case studies, it's not just old dudes that want Viagra that we're taking care of. So what are some of the common things that you know people may come in for? You saw some of the case studies, but kind of looking at the chief complaint and then finding the diagnoses the diagnosis may be enlarged prostate, overactive bladder, incontinence, so leakage of urine, stones, um, cancers, tumors, prostate cancer, low testosterone, and other things. What I also end up seeing a lot of is male wellness checks. So dudes just hear about us and feel more comfortable seeing a urologist and want me to do their like, basic primary care stuff. I will do some of it, but I will always uh, take a step back and refer them to a urologist. Uh, or, or sorry. Um, oh, my camera's a a black screen. Oh my God. When did that happen, dude? It just happened just a minute ago or so. So I wanted to let you know, do you mind just turning it off and on? Perfect. That yeah, works. yeah, yeah. No, I think I'll just switch the camera here, man. I'm sorry, man. All right. No uh, I don't know why my other camera went off. So yeah, you can stop me anytime, man. I was just rambling away without people seeing me. So sorry about that. Um, so that being said, uh, we do see a lot of men for general male wellness checks. So this is a male wellness check here that we ended up seeing in the emergency room. I didn't show the whole picture, but that is a nut a bolt, a nut bolt. I forget how to say it. That was wrapped around the base of the penis. Now, why he put that on, I don't know. I don't really get into those questions. But this is when there is a perfect fusion of urology and orthopedic surgery. I've seen, you know, you guys have a talk on orthopedics uh, here, and we actually use a lot of orthopedic instruments to get that nut bolt off. Um, and you know, basically get, help them get all the swelling away. Because if we did not do anything for this and kept that there, his penis would pretty much rot off and die off. So not a good thing to have happen. So listen, I actually now do a lot of consulting and discussions and conversations because I, if you follow me on social media or LinkedIn or anywhere else, you're going to see that I, I like to just be really real about medicine. It's not all perfect. It's not all fun. I try not to put like a filter and you guys probably follow some, you know, some dudes and or, or men and women or nurses or doctors on social media. And you think, oh, my God, their life is perfect. Um, and they have millions of followers. And I want to be like that. Well, let me tell you the truth. There's been doctors because of social media that have lost their jobs. There are doctors on there that may look good in what they do, but they're probably not good if you go see them in the office. There's also doctors on there that, you know, it's a false reality. Again, it's a form of you know, obviously portraying yourself, it could also be a form of marketing. You really need to be careful um, about not thinking that, hey, I want to go into medicine because it's so much fun and, and the doctors are having so much fun. That's not the truth. Doctors are struggling right now. We're not always the primary decision makers when it comes to patients. Face-to-face -face time with patients has become extremely limited. There's people with more severe problems that get priority and like the general stuff just gets put to the backside you can prescribe them all you want, but prescriptions, you can have non-compliance. Not even that, like there's patients out there that can't even afford a copy of $4, $4. Like you probably spend more than that on a Starbucks coffee. Um, so you have to really be cognizant of these things because especially now with the pandemic and the ever looming recession, money is extremely becoming a big problem. Uh, it's very procedure driven. So if you don't like working with your hands, uh, probably not a good choice for you. Patients also want everything right now. We live in an Amazon Prime, Grubhub, 
Uber Eats kind of uh, mentality where they want me to basically fix their problems right now. Like, I can't do that. So I have to kind of bring them back to reality and, um, you know, tell them it's going to take some time. And any free time I have, I'm either doing stuff like this or catching up on notes um, or doing administrative stuff. I would say 20% of my time in medicine or more is probably there to taking notes and writing orders and answering phone calls. Like the actual patient to patient encounter is not hundred percent of my day. So that's important to know because you guys think some of you guys think it's all rosy, but it's not. So how much do we make? Well, you should never go into a specialty based on income, but I think it's also very important to know. Some of you guys are going to be in four or $500,000 in debt. Um, there's also going to be people here that you know, may not be have that much debt, or they may just be interested in something. But I think it's always very important to number one, go into something you like, but hey, it's always good to know the salaries. Now, never ask a physician directly, how much do you make? But you can always look up online, the basics, or you can look up starting salaries. So urology, you see, it's about 427,000. Um, this was a couple of years ago. That's kind of like the base or starting point, and you can always go up, or you can work less and go down. But I think it's pretty good. I think, um, it's, 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 uh, you know, as a first surgeon and stuff, it's, it's pretty good, good lifestyle, but it took me 14 years to get here, 14 years. So it may look great on paper, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of swag and equity to get here. So any questions, Michael, other than why is my screen not working? <laughs> well, aside from that, I don't think we have any questions, but one that I did want to uh, go through is you mentioned, or I mentioned at the beginning, um, how you co-founded Drive for Men's Health, um, pretty related to your specialty, it sounds. What inspired that? What was the motivation behind it? So the Drive for Men's Health um, was a part of my journey, uh, which I'll discuss here in a few minutes. Um, to be 100% honest with you, I once I finished my residency and fellowship and I actually started practicing, I wasn't having fun being a doctor. It really wasn't what I had expected. I was one of those guys that just saw medicine as I was going through with the filter. And then when the filter came off and the reality of medicine came in, I was like, dude, like, what did I sign up for 14 years? And am I just going to kind of go through this whole thing? Like, just like robotically, because I wanted to see more patients, help more people and have a voice beyond just what I do in the office. And so that's where I started engaging people on social media. There was one night that my former partner and I were just chatting and he had just bought a Tesla. This is when Teslas were very rare. Now you can get them, you know, they're a dime a dozen. But we just had this like light bulb go off is, hey man, why don't we like use the Tesla to get guys talking about their health and engage them on social media? So that's when, so out comes the Drive for Men's Health. Our first year we drove nonstop from uh, Central Florida here to New York City. The next year, Three years, we went crazy and drove from Florida to New York to Los Angeles. So 6,000 miles we drove and we stopped at um, institutions, gyms, community centers. We went any place that would invite us and let us be there. And yes, we had our social media campaigns, but on site, kind of talking as many men as we could about their health. What's really cool is, you know, we've taken a pause from it right now because, um, you know, with other things going on, other things we're working on, but it's been cool to see how the drive for men's health has led to a lot, a lot of education and awareness for men, um, you know, in our community. So it's pretty cool, but that it was part of my journey and my journey was not an easy one. So I graduated from high school in 1999. If you're trying to do the math, I'm 40 years old right now. So, um, but 1999 is when I graduated high school. Now in high school, um, and when I first started college, because I didn't have the best grades in high school, I didn't. I was, I think, in the 30th percentile in my class. I just wasn't focused. I didn't, I really, my mom knew I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't know yet I wanted to really be a doctor. So when it came to meds, uh, you know, I always heard you're never going to make it, man. You don't have the grit. You don't have the work ethic. And I made it. I got into one of the best medical schools out there, Boston University. So that's when then started the rest of the journey beyond high school. But then when I got into med school, I decided to do urology. And as you heard, it was kind of a late decision. 
I was told just pick something easy. And that's because my step one score was average. Urology requires a very high step one score. Um, my step one score was average. So I was like, man, it's going to be a big struggle to get in. So everyone was, you know, just saying, Hey man, just do something easier or something more approachable. Uh, but I say, you know what? Screw it. I really want this. I want to do this. If I have to take a year off, I'll take a year off, but I'm going to do it. So then I made sure all my grades uh, were, were, were stellar in med school. And then I even took my step too early and I got a really good score. But then somehow through some divine intervention, you know, I got 14 interviews. So I was like, holy moly, you know, this, this, this may be, this may be possible. And we do something called the match and ranking. And I actually matched in one of my top choices. So it was like, holy moly, I made it. So I write this here because, um, you know, you can listen to people and follow quotes and get them kind of stuck in your ears and mind, but you can do it. Just listen to your own heart and your own voice. And that journey has been one of the coolest journeys that, that, that I've ever had. Um, and it's led to so many different opportunities. So when it comes to beyond just medicine, I'm currently chair of credentials for our hospital. I'm the form of chief of surgery. I'm the director of the West Coast side of urology. Some of the unique roles I've if you Google my name, you're going to see I'm quoted constantly in Men's Health Magazine, and I've been on CNN and other things. I've also been one of the youngest presidents of our state society, the Florida Urological Society. So it's been really cool um, to be able to do all these things at such a young age. So that's um, some pictures. That's me when I do live TV. I've done a TED, TEDx talk. I engage as many students as I can and opportunities to speak to them. And then up here are my three daughters. Now that's when they were much younger. Now they're older, nine, nine, and 10. And this was kind of cool. Uh, I show this not to brag, but uh, when I was in my rut that I talked about earlier, I watched this movie called The Secret. And I know it's kind of cheesy, but The Secret is um, essentially uh, a book that kind of, it's a motivational thing, but it kind of gives you like folk, a little focus. So they make you write like a vision board or like, you know, write on a piece of paper, 10 things you want to accomplish. So I wrote 10 things I wanted to accomplish. And little did I know that sometimes these things take 10 years, sometimes they take longer, but within eight years, this being the last thing that I really wanted to do, I was able to accomplish it. So I'm like, holy moly, like once you put your focus to it, it's possible. And um, this was, you know, something I, I felt very honored and privileged to do. And I continue to get to do this now when I do have time. So if I did it, anyone can. So please believe in yourself. Michael, any questions? Yeah, so a few questions over, we have three questions over what you mentioned so far. We'll start with the first being about um, how you talked about persevering through all the debt. You, you mentioned the, the salaries that you'll see across different specialties. So one student just asks, in general, how did you persevere through med school with all the debt, the long time education that it took, being in that men mentality that you were in med school for the next four years. And then after that, you still had residency. And then after that, even then being an attending, you still had to pay off your loans. It's quite a mental, um, it takes a lot of your energy just thinking about it. It's, it's a burden, even when you're trying to practice. It is a huge burden. Um, and if you, if you get stressed out by finances, eh, then this may not be the best way to go. But, but you don't have to be $400,000 in debt. You don't. You can, there are some places that do have scholarships, but more importantly, there's state schools versus other schools. Like you can definitely find some kind of support out there. You know, me, I was fortunate where a good portion of it, just to be honest with you, like, I'm not going to lie to you, like my parents supported it. Now, obviously now I give back as much as I can to kind of balance that out, but they support a lot of my journey. Now, a lot of us may not be fortunate with that and may get that debt. But listen, that debt, can be easily paid off afterwards. Um, you know, it's the you, when you're going to buy a when you're going to buy a house, you're going to have a mortgage that's going to have debt. When you're going to buy a car, when you buy a car, unless you got cash sitting around, you're going to have debt there. So this is one of those things that that's there. Um, what's really cool is once you get into the profession, you know, you can pay it off. I mean, it may take some time. You can pay it off, but listen, is that really worth not following your passion? I don't think so. And then a few other questions. Um, 
one other student asks, how do you deal with being or just having less face-to-face -face interaction and building a better bond with your patients? <laughs> you just got to build a bond faster. Uh, it, and, and I've gotten really good at this. Like, you know, sometimes I'll have four minutes with a patient, five minutes with a patient. Um, and I realize like I've done a good job creating those bonds is because when the patients end up seeing, let's say my nurse practitioner, or I'm stuck in the OR and they don't see me, like they get really sad or they reschedule They're like, Oh, I want to see Dr. Brown. I just want to say hi to him. I'm like, all right. You know, like, okay, make them wait. And I'll come say hi. They just want to say hi because they really feel like uh, a part of the family when it comes to our office. Um, but what I try to do to build those relationships. So there's a really cool book um, called cues. It's about like, um, you know, mannerisms and eye contact and other things. There's lots of books on it, but I really found that like really helpful in kind of fine tuning what I already do. Um, and essentially you got to find a way to connect and you can do that physically or you can do it verbally. The way I do it verbally is the second I get into the room, I try to find something that I can relate to with the patient. So if they're wearing a Yankees hat, I jokingly say, whoa, I can't see you as a patient because I'm a Red Sox fan because <laughs> um, I want to be you, right? Then if they have like sneakers, I'm really into sneakers. Like, yo, dude, where'd you get those sneakers? Like, you know, I want to know because I love sneakers. I'll show them mine and we'll have a conversation. You know, they may be wearing a t-shirt that says like Long Island or like San Francisco or bus. And I'll be like, yo, San Francisco, I've been there. How is it? So I usually spend the first 30 seconds with all my new patients, like not in front of the screen, typing away not trying to, you know, like, um, you know, figure out my way out the electronic chart. I'm looking them face to face in the eye. I smile on my face, no computer in front of me, just getting to know them and saying hello and finding something that I can relate to. Does it work on every patient? No, but it does work on 99% of patients. So you can build that bond quicker by knowing how you can connect to them quicker. And I, I, my, I do that by just finding something ornament wise um, that they're wearing or doing to kind of build that connection. Great question. Yeah, definitely. Another student asks, what advice would you give for any undergrads thinking of taking a gap year um, between their final year of undergrad and going on to medical school? So that, you know, that's, that's really up to you. So I used to be on the admissions committee for uh, one of the med schools here in town. Um, I learned a lot about the whole process. Um, it's really hard to apply to med school right now because obviously the first thing they look at is your MCAT and MCAT can be hard or easy depending on what kind of test taker you are. And then once you go through the funnel, it's like, there's all these check marks. Um, and what I realize is like, you could have someone, cause we do, they do look at all the applications. Uh, the people that kind of make it through much easier are not the ones with the best scores not the ones with like parents that are doctors. I always, and I can only speak for myself, try to look for something unique. You know, some of our schools out there have like, you know, things, okay, you got to do hundred hours of this, 500 hours of this, do this, this is very robotic. And then when I read even the essays and stuff, it all sounds like robotic, like you're just doing it and someone advised you to do it. But the, but the people that have had really unique stories, like did something nonprofit wise and you know, across the, across the world somewhere, like, decide to work for a year and get an MBA or we're, we're an athlete and they compete in the Olympics. And obviously not, not all of us can compete in the Olympics, but it's doing something unique that makes you memorable. Um, so if you need to take a gap year because you got a crappy MCAT score, absolutely do it. If you're taking a gap year, just because you want to kind of have a year to enjoy and relax and see the world, do it. Um, but if you're just kind of doing it because you're not sure if you're going to mat if you're going to get in or not, well, just try and see what happens. You can always take the gap year, but in that gap year, don't be a nerd or a geek the entire time, like trying to get into med school. Take time for yourself and explore and um, build uh, your experiences. Because I'm telling you, the more experiences you have, you're going to be a better physician at the end of the day. You talked about your experience being. Um in the 30th percentile in high school and then jumping off of that into uh, a really hard work ethic and now being at your position today. One student asks, do you think that back in high school, not being in the top 
um, percentiles of, of students set you back early on like going into undergrad, just knowing how to do things? Was it a setback or do you think it provided more, more motivation for yourself? I mean, I wasn't the 30 percentile because I was, you know, dumb. Uh, I just didn't really care. Like I didn't want to study or anything. Um, so what happened, uh, to me was I was prepared for college, but I knew that this was time to like, kind of like turn the switch on and go, go, go. So when I started college, like I didn't go out that as much. My, I was very fortunate because I actually ended up staying in the med, med student or pre-med ward of um, Warren Towers, which is like a big first year uh, towers. And so it was pretty cool to be on that floor with people like minded people, but I met two friends back then on that floor that are still my friends for life. And we actually ended up living together the next subsequent years. It was who I was surrounding myself with that kept me motivated and made happen what I would happen now. I didn't say this yet, but I actually got into med school one year early. So I went from like slacker to getting into med school a year and a half into my journey in college because BU has this um, early acceptance program um, for you know about 12 students that apply. There's like hundreds of students that apply. All three of us got in. And that's because we had this shared goal of, okay, let's make this happen. Um, so I think I was prepared. I just didn't have the focus or the intention. So I, I you know, honestly, like if you if you go to a, a private school or other school or college, or even if you start off with a community college, you can still make your med school dreams come true. It really at the end of the day it comes down to work ethic. And when you want to turn that on. And for me, it was when college started. Yeah. A lot of people think, or maybe just early on, they have the misconception that you start at a certain point and you can only get so far after that. Um, to your point, just with the story you mentioned, it illustrates how it's not really the case. Work does bring you pretty far, um, farther than you'd think. It does. And you, and you should never stop. I mean, we had, in my med school class, we had two people that were 50 years old that had wanted to change their careers. Um, so it's possible anytime. I think what happens is we get a lot of pressure from, you know, I have Indian parents, like we get pressure from parents, people all around us. I think if you just kind of do it because you want to, you know, you're going to be much better off. Oh, by the way, if you do take a year off, I would highly recommend um, doing a course or something in finance or marketing. Um, that's stuff falling in my office here. <laughs> Um, or doing uh, some kind of entrepreneurial thing because there's a business side to medicine that's very important to kind of take a deep dive in. So, Mike, I'm going to kind of go over some cases for the sake of time here. Um, again, viewer discretion advised. Uh, you know, there may be some pictures you don't, you may not want to watch. So, this was the 55 year old male that I mentioned that had the high PSA, trouble peeing. Now, for us, like when I'm in medicine. Um, you really have to, you know, you have these forms where you kind of gather all this information. These forms can be over, extremely overwhelming. Now, when you're at my stage in your career, like a lot of this is already filled out by the patient and a lot of it's inputted by like other people in my office. And I just have to go in, correct it, look at it and see how it affects what the patient's here for from urology. It's important to know, but it can be very overwhelming. The way I tell patients is think of their history as a story. So you know how we love movies? Like I just saw The Rise of Groot, I think Groot, uh, the Minion movie. And it's it's a story, middle, you got the beginning, middle, and end. So think of this as the beginning of the story. And when you kind of start creating a story and narrative, it's much easier to digest this information. So you got past medical history, surgeries, prescriptions, non-prescriptions, drug allergies, very important to know. Um, social history, do they smoke? You don't see here, but you got to ask about vaping and other things. Um, education, occupation, what do they do? It's very important. Um, family history. And then obviously specific to male men and women. So in this 55-year-old male, yes, he had a high PSA um, and trouble urinating in his dad had, has a history of cancer, GI cancer. He really didn't have any other past medical history. He's had no surgeries medications wise he was just on like a small um, blood pressure pill uh um he had no allergies social history he used to smoke but not anymore family history the colon cancer thing and he really doesn't have any other symptoms um 
beyond that and on his exam, his prostate and everything felt fine. So when we do that whole did this whole workup, obviously the PSA was for cancer screening. So we, and this patient did the whole cancer screening part. And we realized that uh, when we did a repeat PSA a few times afterwards, the first one was probably just a fluke to kind of even help us even more. Now we have uh, MRIs of the prostate where we can really take a deep dive and you know, see, okay, this is something, is there really a risk of cancer? Should we do a biopsy or is this just something because of age or size and volume of the prostate? So in him, he ended up having really trouble urinating and he had a high PSA because he just had a big prostate. So what we do for these patients, um, obviously there's medications, but there's also some really cool surgeries. So this is like something that we've been doing even before I became a doctor. This is called a TERP. It's a prostate resection. And this, you're looking at the camera inside the urethra. So we start off in the bladder. This is me looking at the prostate on the inside. So when we're really young, this channel is open. You can see the bladder open when I'm, from where I'm at. But as you get older, the prostate grows. So in this patient, it was growing beyond the space that it's in and then into the bladder. So it was really causing issues peeing. So this is now me with a loop, um, pretty much opening up the prostate. I call it a rotor rooter. Uh, we're essentially opening up the channel by kind of taking out the chips. So this can be done in a circular fashion, however, and the end goal really is to open up that channel where the patient is able to flow. Now, lots of bad things can happen here. You can have bleeding, you can have scarring. There's also nerves that are important for erection. So you don't wanna go too deep on the sides. And then you also have the muscle that keeps you continent. So it keeps you from not leaking or dribbling at the end um, or the distal aspect. So pretty much, um, there's a lot of things we have to be careful about, but once we do this, like patients do actually very well. And that's me kind of taking out the little chips and you can see the difference from the first picture to now when it comes to the prostate. So this is kind of like one of our most common procedures, but not everyone needs it, not everyone gets it, but it's pretty cool to see how it can help people um, when they do get it. So that's that patient. So then we had the 35 year old female um, who had uh, recurrent infections. She had blood in the urine. She had a gastric bypass. So her history, she uh, was morbidly obese, but now is actually of normal weight. Um, after she got the gastric bypass two years ago, she's running, she ran a half marathon. You know, she's pretty healthy. She's off some of the blood pressure medications and some of the early diabetic medication she was on. So she lost the weight and is really in, in prime shape. So we did the workup on her because she had blood in the urine. So any patient that has blood in the urine, Mostly we see it in older patients, but in younger patients, selectively we'll do the full workup as well, especially when it's gross blood that they actually see, not just on a lab test. Um, and in those patients, um, or in this patient, we did a workup. The workup is two things. One is a CAT scan of the belly. And the second thing is looking inside the bladder. So in her, what we actually found was um, a large kidney stone. So this was actually me um, doing something called a PCNL. So that's, this is, we're actually inside the kidney, but we're actually going in to the kidney from the back. So we actually make a small little opening in the back of the kidney. And then we go in with these instruments that allow us to kind of really fragment and suck out the stone. So this is what I'm doing here right now. And a, most, I would say about, uh, half her kidney was full of these stones. So this case took about an hour to do, but I was able to kind of suck out and fragment everything out, which is, this is actually one of my most favorite procedures. Um, so this is me kind of keep going and going and going. I'm not going to bore you for an hour, but it's pretty cool when we do do it and it works. Um, so that was that patient. So then we get to this 28 year old male. So this guy had pain in his balls. He's had a history of a hernia repair and he's also having trouble having babies. So interestingly, um, this was a patient that in his medical history, when his wife was not there, admitted that he's been on testosterone. Um, testosterone can definitely cause fertility issues because when you take testosterone from the outside, it shuts down your testicles, which means shuts down sperm, sperm production, also shuts down um, uh, your testosterone production. So everything that the testicles are supposed to do, they're not, they don't do anymore because they're like, oh man, we got enough. We don't got to work. So we, they stop working. Um, so this patient, uh, you know, we, I, I was like, man, why is this, why is he having pain? Like, you know, when I would examine him, it didn't really look that painful, but he had this lump on the right. And he also had a lump on the left. I'm like, 
dude, what's going on? Like, you know, I, 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 yeah, I'm a little confused. So this is a patient. This is actually a real case um, where the second time I saw him, because we got an ultrasound and we did this whole workup, check hormones. He's like, doc, like I've got a vasectomy, but my wife doesn't know. <laughs> so there's patients that decide to, for birth control purposes, get vasectomies and then they fall in love and they're like, oh man, but now I want to have a kid. So this patient, what we ended up doing on him, it was actually a vasectomy reversal. So once he admitted to the thing, these are, this is the vas, this is the vas deference. So the testicle makes the sperm, the epididymis is where the sperm mature and the vas is where the sperm kind of travel all the way into the ejaculate. So a vasectomy is when it gets cut and divided. Here, I'm basically taking those tubes. Now, these are really small tubes, super small. The sutures we use on here are finer than our hair. So you can't even see it without the magnification from a microscope or here we use the robot, the Da Vinci robot to do this procedure. The robot doesn't make me any better. It's just easier to do the procedure. And, um, you know, it's not as tiring or taxing. And if I drink too much coffee, it kind of mitigates my uh, tremor in my hand. So this is me kind of setting everything up. Um, and then eventually uh, that's the suture that I'll take it and start putting these tubes back together. So that was that patient. Now, then we had the 75 year old blood in the urine. She's lost weight. She's, it's, you know, she's smoking and doesn't want to stop smoking. So in this patient, you know, the first thing when I walked in, I'm like, oh, she has cancer. So she has something like cancer uh, because I'm like, that's what it is. But every patient gets the same workup. And in her, interestingly, there was no cancer, no tumors, but we actually had the finding of a big bladder stone. Now, why she had big bladder stones um, in the bladder. Well, that's a conversation for a different day, but we incidentally did find that. And this is us kind of going with the laser now. So last time it was a device that shocks. This is actually a device that the laser actually fragments the stone. And then once the stone is fragmented, uh, we kind of suck it all out here. So you can see all the stone here. Sorry, I'm fast forwarding this. It was all fragmented and we take it out. Pretty cool procedure. Um, so now, <laughs> I'm going to show you some pictures uh, before we kind of take another question break of some patients that were bored and wanted attention. Um, this was a patient, actually, this is, I think, from like four months ago, that decided to stick a pen um, into their penis. And he's actually an incarcerated male, so he's a prisoner. So sometimes prisoners do th certain things. I don't know why they do them, but they want to take maybe a holiday from their uh, prison. So this guy actually had a wire stuck around the pen. So even when we try to take it out, it's very difficult. So this is me trying to grab it. And eventually I was able to grab it and get it out. And you see on the bottom there, that's actually the, the, the little sharp edge that he created. Crazy. I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to see this after my training days, but I still see them, see them in my uh, current practice. So that was the foreign body that we had to take out. Now, here's some other cases. So this was a male that was sent to the emergency room. Um, and uh, Michael, I'm gonna ask you, man, what's the, what's the organ on the right and the left? Um, the one on the right, I think is the sacrum. And the one on the left, I'm not sure. All right, so the one on the right is actually his testicle. So this was a schizophrenic patient that thought there are parts of his body that were you know, hurting him. So he actually, made an incision and ripped out his testicle. But not only did he rip out his testicle, he ripped out his eye. So the thing on the left was actually his eyeball. It was pretty cool, like doing surgery on him. We were not able to put any of this stuff back together, but we did, you know, kind of try and clean things up. But yep, real case. This um, was a patient that um, take, took too much Viagra and then decided to snort some cocaine at the same time and did a whole bunch of things that made him at risk for having a prolonged erection. So we did stuff in the emergency room. We couldn't get it out, but now we had to do this procedure where we actually suck out the, the old blood that's clotted and then bring that penis down. This um, was uh, a penile fracture. So we don't have bones in the penis, but uh, you can definitely rip and tear them. And this usually happens during some kind of sexual encounter. So you have like an oops moment, either when it's doggy style or the, the female's on top, an oops moment that led to this crack. So we actually, in the emergency room, emergently have to suture everything back together. So the pleasure uh, may have been pleasurable at that moment in time, but um, now he's going to have some major problems the rest of his life. Now, that doesn't mean you should kind of not do anything exciting in the bedroom or whatnot, 
it's just, you know, be careful because stuff like this can happen. Uh, this was a dude that um, had a spot growing uh, for years and didn't really tell anyone. Someone didn't really examine him. And eventually he saw his primary care, a, a different primary care doctor, and they found this. And that's actually a huge, um, ended up being a tumor uh, of the penis. So he needed a partial penectomy where he took half his penis off. And, you know, when we do that, you're pretty much cured, but you can see this could have been easily avoidable uh, if he had just spoken up a little bit earlier. And we also see kids. Uh, this was a kid who got his foreskin stuck in a zipper. And this was probably one of the hardest cases to do because not, you're not only taking care of the patient, but the mom and the dad. Um, and it was not a fun thing for the kid to have this. But hey, we the urologist came in and saved the day on this case too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of pause here, Michael. And if there are any more questions, I know I'm a urologist. But I wanted to kind of spend the last couple of minutes here talking about collaboration with other specialties, number one. And number two, why it's important to not just focus on your specialty, but learn a little bit of everything because I use everything on a daily basis. I may not be an expert at it. So, Michael, if there's any questions, I'll take a pause. If not, we'll kind of finish this stuff. Yeah, well, with the general specialty being urology, um, well, first of all, in general, medicine is really special, unique and uh, sought after because you can enter a patient's room, not know them, uh, maybe just know their name, but they're very vulnerable with you. Um, they'll open up to you. And in neurology, it's even more private of a topic. It's, um, especially in our culture, it's not something that people will sometimes feel comfortable with. Maybe that's because that's how, how they were raised. It really just depends on the person. So when approaching a patient, let's say it's a first time patient with complications or just the general talk, um, how does that work? What, what's your approach with patients on such a culturally um, censored topic? It, it, it can definitely be censored, man. Um, you know, my mom tells everyone I'm a kidney surgeon. She used to say I'm a transplant surgeon. I, I've never done a transplant. I mean, I've been a, done a rotation uh, in residency on it, but uh, so, you know, it, it's hard for my mom to say I help people have sex um, and other things. Uh, so yes. I think, you know, my experience in that kind of, I think makes it easier for me to just, you know, get these people to open up. So what I do is I used to, when I started, like be very timid, like I was like, oh, I can't say the word sex or erections or all these other, you know, intimate words in urology. Now it doesn't matter who it is. When I can tell it's going to be awkward for them and me, because maybe we may know each other or something, or maybe like a cultural thing I have to bypass. I just say it like, Oh, you're here because you can't get it up, man. Let's let's talk about it. Let me see what I can help you out with. You're just going in and just kind of saying it. I feel like you're like, all right, okay. Because most dudes want to say it. They just need something to kind of, you know, they don't want the whole medical jargon. Like, please tell me about your function and all this other stuff. I just talk to them like he's 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 my dude friend, and say, yo, dude, you're having trouble getting it up. Like, what's going on? And then it kind of leads to um, a much better conversation. But that's okay when it's something casual. But if it's something like a cancer diagnosis or something else, you know, you have to be very careful. That's when I start off with, hey, I just tell them what I think they have. I don't make them suffer through 15 minutes of like me asking questions. And I tell them, listen, this is going to feel really weird, but I'm going to kind of tell you the end of the movie here. You're going to need an operation for sure. And let me explain to you why. It's because I'm trying to save your life. I really do think this is something bad. Now, I want you to just listen and hear me out and I'll kind of explain things. So when I just tell them the end of the movie, like when they know what the plan is going to be, they're much more likely to just open up and just, just say it. It's when we're like trying to like be all timid, like, hey, what's your past medical history? Did your dad have any cancers? Are you sure? Have you, you know, you're kind of like trying to tell them what they have, but not telling them. It's better just to, just to tell them now you know, it's, it's, it's very personalized. I can't really tell you what works for me. It's just, everything is kind of like, you know, has to be tailored to the patient, but those are two tactics that I work for me very well. I think we'll save the rest of the questions for after. If you want to address one more though, um, yeah. it's about how, you know, we mentioned you're an on-air health expert. You mentioned um, being on CNN a few times, that's not something that you usually see in a typical physician's role. Like you mentioned, it's usually in the office and admin work, and then that's their day. But in branching out, extending outside of that, 
Um, how did you even get involved in that sort of that that line of work, media combined yeah. with medicine? So, I mean, I think you see a lot more doctors engaged on social media, like whether it's Twitter or Instagram or TikTok. I think COVID really got a lot of my colleagues to like just go out there and create content. So it used to be rare, but now I see a lot more people engaging in it. Number one, because they want to share information. That's always been my goal is try to help as many people as I can. Number two, I don't do it for this purpose, but I know other people do. It's for marketing their practice. Um, I think your online, I give a whole hour long talk on this um, at conferences, but you have to really have a personal brand and you have to maintain the personal brand. So what if that includes your Google reviews or includes like some social media platform that you're committing to, you know, make sure it's consistent and make sure it's clean and make sure you kind of continue it. Um, now I would say like 10 or 20% of my patients are just finding me because of online or word of mouth or, you know, I'm like quoted in a chapter in some magazine from men's health magazine, like um, that deals with like sex and intimacy. Like they just find me. Uh, I just do it because I enjoy it. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where you may not be good at it, but I think you should think about having, you know, what, what what's your presence going to be? I think you as med students, I think it's, I think LinkedIn is a really cool thing to be on from a networking standpoint. Um, so, you know, it's where, you know, don't be super annoying and kind of like hit up, you know, even if you're a med student and you're thinking about residency, don't be super annoying and, you know, try to talk to chairmen and all these things like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. Like, um, you know, just be nonchalant, post some good content. And when the time is right, you know, you can kind of engage them and say hello, but it's a really cool way to kind of bypass all the bureaucracy by having that, you know, that online connection with these individuals. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it definitely did. It's a sphere that I think a lot of students are very interested in. I'm sure a lot of students listening in just to learn about our program. They've been on social media. They've um, heard about you, other influencers. So uh, it's something that's definitely growing, especially in our day and age. It's growing, but be careful. Mm -hmm. You know, don't just do it because because you want to be Dr. Mike, right? Like, and you want to be popular and you want to be a YouTube star. Um, you know, there's so many videos of, you know, girls and people screaming when Dr. Mike walks in. Great. You know, like, you know, he's, he's a good looking doctor, right? Not all of us are going to be able to do that. There's more people like putting up content that's getting them in trouble than someone like him that's putting up good content. So be very careful, like, and also look at your past life. Like if you said something you shouldn't have said in the, you know, or, you know, I actually, um, early on in my career, took a deep dive in like my Facebook and Twitter. And there were certain things like me partying in Memphis or, you know, certain things when I was like down, I'm like, world sucks, you know, like, uh, or I was just quoting things out of immaturity and I, you know, got rid of them. Cause I'm like, this is not me now. And I don't want people thinking of me in this way or in misinterpreting. So I think, you know, you don't want to erase your past, but you have to be very careful about what you're posting and what you're doing. That doesn't mean you can't, you know, like, Oh, Roe, we, Roe versus Wade. Like, Oh my God, they, they did this Supreme court this. You can still state your opinion if you feel comfortable stating it. Um, but, but at the same time, like, just be careful at the same time. Right. You know, that there's certain etiquette and tact that you can um, say things with. Um, I think it's always good to be on the conservative careful side than kind of just be all out there on certain topics. I think that's all the questions we have for now. So, um, so this, I was going to see if we had time um, and we do. So I'm just going to kind of show you like collaboration. So urologists, yes, we do surgery and we see patients, but a lot of what we do is imaging based. I mentioned a few times, ultrasounds of the balls. I mentioned um, uh, things like, um, you know, CAT scans, other things. Imaging is very important because it really, uh, really helps us with diagnoses. And so just kind of an educational thing and to show you, you know, where you're virtually shadowing me. So what I do a lot of is actually look at my own imaging. You have to know a little bit of everything in medicine, everything, whether it's business or about pediatrics or whether it's about imaging, um, whether it's about blood pressure medications, like there's, you know, I didn't really understand why I was forced to learn certain things in med school or, you know, continue learning certain things during residency. I'm like, this is not urology. Why do I have to know this? I see now that it's all very important uh, because a blood pressure pill could be affecting what I'm trying to do. Or if I put them on, like there's a prostate supplement 
that I can put people on, but that supplement, if they're on Coumadin, can cause them to have more bleeding and everything. So it's like these, all these things are actually very, very important. Now you can, you're never going to be an expert. I don't know. I don't remember the mechanism of action of Coumadin uh, in that much detail, but I do know it's a medication that's a blood thinner. And then this thing for urology can affect it. So you got to know a little bit of everything. So in this case, you got to know a little bit of everything when it comes to imaging. So CAT scans, you know, been around for a long time. I've had like four CAT scans in my life because of my kidney stone history, but it's kind of like the go-to imaging test for not just me, but other specialties. And it really helps us kind of collect a lot of information. Now, some people feel like CAT scans and ultrasounds can substitute for the physical exam and the history taking. I completely disagree. I still believe talking to the patient, building that relationship, getting information, um, and actually touching and examining the patient, it could be kind of targeted to your organ parts and your body parts is very, very, still very, very important. So in your careers, do not, do not, if you want to be a good doctor, do not just kind of um, be an imaging specialist or a reader or orderer, you know, still think about the entire patient. I also look at a lot of my CAT scans. I'm not here to talk bad about radiologists. I love my radiologists, but you know, we can, we can all make errors. Like I can sometimes not, you know, not suture right, or, you know, something can go wrong, even in my surgeries or my diagnoses. And the same thing for radiology. Like there's so many times that not so many times, I don't want to say that because I want to get in trouble, but um, there's times where the stone will be on the top of the ureter and they'll say it's on the bottom of the ureter. And it could be like an auto dictation problem. The size can be off. They can say it's a small stone, but when I look at the different cuts, it can actually be a larger stone, which can affect how I take care of that patient you know, do they really have swelling in their kidney? Um, and are there other things causing it? So, you know, I always try to really look at the imaging before the read comes out and I always verify with the radiologist. And it's really cool. It's really cool to be able to kind of um, look at these imagings and kind of like know what the inside of the body is. So yeah, you can go inside the CAT scanner all different ways and you can get um, different cuts. So there's axial cut, which goes top to bottom. Um, axial cuts were actually... Uh, what I got tested on during anatomy. So it's, you know, I see them every single day, but also brings PTSD from the days that <laughs> I had my anatomy exams. Um, this coronal where actually when you're looking at the patient and then there's sagittal when you're looking at from the side. So when we actually look at CAT scans, um, the we're doing certain things at the same time. We may get a CAT scan without contrast. That's when we're looking for kidney stones where there's nothing injected in the patient. Um, we may get a CAT scan with contrast. And it may be just contrast once or maybe like delayed imaging. So usually we get something called a CT urogram, which is a CAT scan without contrast. Then a CAT scan with, um, that's, that, and they do another scan almost immediately after doing the contrast where it shows us the arterial phase of the kidney. So you see the kidney like really bright up, light up. Um, and then there's also the third delayed, as you can see here, 10 to 15 minutes later, where we wait for the contrast to kind of go into the collecting system. This helps us look for, you can't find everything, but it can really show blockages in the ureter, swelling of the ureter, tumors, help us assess for tumors versus cysts in the kidneys, um, and obviously kidney stones. Um, but when we're looking at these CAT scans, and let's say we do have a stone or differences, we look at something called Hansful units. This Hansful units is really like, you know, there's like a grayscale, like you see here. So using that grayscale, Sometimes a radiologist, or you can do it yourself, can kind of assess, is this really a stone? Is it really something I have to worry about? And so I actually now, nine years into practice, I'm kind of starting to kind of you do this on my own just to learn because you, know, you get bored of doing the same thing over and over sometimes. Um, and I'm trying to see like, hey, can I diagnose things such as like the radiologists do? So this um, ended up actually, you can't really see it great in here, but this was a, a image where the where the part of the kidney lit up and the Hounsville units were different. Um, and it ended up turning out to be a kidney cancer. You can also use it to kind of help you gauge what type of kidney stone a patient has. So this is actually the most five, five most common types of stones. I actually had a calcium oxalate stone uh, myself. That's the most common stone, but then there's also other types of stones. Out of here, there is one type of stone that you can actually get rid of just using medical management. And that's a uric acid stone. So it's pretty cool that CAT scans can kind of help you assess that stuff. We can also look for clots in the bladder. Now you see here on the left, like you see these things now, is that clot? Is that a tumor? Um, 
what is it? But we knew, I knew this patient, what was going on. And that was actually a clot uh, in the patient's bladder. You can look at fistulas, patients that have really bad diverticulitis. So inflammation of like little outpouchings of the colon, sometimes all that swelling or inflammation or infection can kind of seed and connect to the bladder. And that's when they have a fistula. So you can kind of assess for that um, here. And you can actually see where you can, see the arrow is like, that's where the connection is happening with the bladder versus the bowels. Then there's swelling. So you see here on the left, you, you know, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but you got the right kidney and then you got the left kidney on the right kidney. You can see it's super duper swollen. That's pretty severe hydronephrosis. On the other side, um, on the second image, you see it is a little swollen. That's like mild hydronephrosis. That's just swelling of the kidneys. The kidneys um, can sometimes be found in the pelvis. That's if you have a congenital issue. You can also find really big bladders. <laughs> this, this dude's bladder was huge. Had, he over, had over a liter in his, in his bladder. You can sometimes find weird shapes. So there's heart shapes and other shapes to um, imaging. You can also use not just CAT scans, but other, just simple imaging tech, um, modalities to find foreign bodies. So this was actually another incarcerated male that put pins and needles and other things and screws uh, into his scrotum and also into his belly. So this was a pretty interesting image to read. And then you have foreign bodies where this was a silicone urethral sound that was inserted inside. And then you have some really cool things that remind you of where you live, Disney World. And that, that's a Mickey Mouse diverticulum, which is just stretched out spaces within the bladder because it has too much pressure in it. And in most cases, it's because of um, enlarged prostate. So all this stuff, as I mentioned, we did all these cases and I talked about how we assess them and I had talked about what we treatments we have to offer them. But this is a very important part of that entire process as well. And so I really wanted to take some time to kind of, kind of show you uh, the deep link in some case scenarios. So that being said, I'm going to kind of end here and I want to, you know, then we'll answer questions, but you see that QR code there that kind of links up to, you know, if you want to connect with me, um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, hit me up there. I'll try to put a link of, of this presentation on there as well, if you want to look at it afterwards, but you can also just look at it on the YouTube channel live stream as well. Um, but no, it's been a great honor and a privilege. And, um, you know, again, I'll start and end with pretty much what I said here multiple times is, never give up, give up on your dreams. I didn't. And, um, I found a lot of happiness and never giving up and don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. You can definitely do it. Uh, whether it's medicine or you change to something else. Um, if you put your mind and heart to it, anything's possible. So thank you. Well, we really appreciate you coming on and joining us, Dr. Bromba. It's been such a joy to have you. Um, it's been a very, very exciting session. We're always excited. Students are always enthusiastic about patient cases. That's our, our number one thing. They always look forward to it. So we love to see so many. Um, and we really did get a great glimpse of what it is to work um, in urology. So that's absolutely fantastic. I'm glad we started the summer off with this session. I had a few questions I wanted to go through. So earlier on, you mentioned um, the demographics or the statistics about private practice versus being employed. You said being employed is the majority. Um, private practice is, I think it was 20%, right? Around there. Uh, I think it's like 20, 30%. 30%. So students, they often hear about, you know, like you mentioned, there's medicine, there's administrative tasks. Do you find any misconceptions or things that students in general lack awareness of when you talk about private practice versus employment? Um, I think uh, really quickly, I just want to mention that I don't just do surgery all the time. I would say 30 or percent or more of what I offer patients is medical therapy or just holding their hand through a problem that they may have. Um, so I guess I'm a surgical specialty, but what makes medicine, but urology really cool is that uh, I can really, I have things I can treat patients with medically uh, and surgically. So that being said, um, what are the common misconceptions? So um, I'll just start off with this man. Everyone thinks we make a lot of money. It, it, yes and no. I mean, you have to look at the time commitment, sweat equity. Um, but really, the, it, it's not true. Most people don't, or they may be in debt, or you know, they may be like inflating their self-worth. But eventually, as you move forward, yes, you can. 
The other thing, uh, misconception is that, oh man, medicine's going, going down. You know, you shouldn't do it. There's no future in it. Well, it is, there's a lot of competition in the market. You've got the Amazons and the Microsofts and, you know, these big entities trying to get into the healthcare space. How does that change things? How does that change reimbursement? Um, so there is a lot of unknowns um, in terms of like, what's the role of a doctor going to be? Are nurse practitioners going to take over the world now? Like, you know, what's going to happen? I think a lot of those doom and gloom things is kind of like when you turn on the TV and watch the news now, like it's like, you know, it's very sensationalized. And you're like, oh yeah, let me keep watching it. Let me take a deep dive. And then you get depressed. You know, honestly, I don't even watch the news now. I just listen to for some quick snippets of news because it does depress me big time. So it's the same thing with this, like medicine ain't going anywhere. People are still going to get sick. This is still a very noble profession. And there's always going to be a space for you. You may not, you know, make the money that you may have seen on that thing, but you'll still be content and you'll still be happy. Um, so I, I wouldn't let that be a basis. I think the biggest thing for private practice versus um, employed is, you know, do you just want to kind of go and do your thing and not have to worry about hiring and firing and quality and all that? I mean, not quality, but like, you know, all the administrative stuff, then you get, then you become employee. Um, so lifestyle can be a little bit better when you're employed or do you, are you, do you have an entrepreneurial spirit and you want to build something and grow something and be in control of what you create, then that's when you go into private, private practice. A lot of people are transitioning because we do have a generational change now. Like, you know, I don't want to work, you know, hundred hours a week. Um, I want to have a lifestyle. My family's my priority. Um, so that's why I chose employed physician. I think there's a lot more phys physicians like that out there now. And in terms of just with private practice, if you know of any colleagues, in terms of just how to get that started up, are there any um, things that they've picked up from their training? Things like, I'm not sure, it's, it's kind of like financial literacy. It's not something that you'll see in med school or residency often. Um, is that the same? You don't really see often people don't really train for that sort of business? No, no. I mean, I mean, it, it, the right programs try to kind of teach you the business side. Like I, I honestly didn't even like think about billing and coding and like, you know, modifiers and all these things until like, you know, I finished like, you know, maybe my attendings maybe brought it up, but really it was, you, you're just focused on learning as much as you can, kind of learning from your mistakes if you're good at something, fine tuning it. Like your your pay, your focus at that time is not the finances; it's the education. That's how it should be. You know, when you're in residency and training, like it's good to know a little bit about what's going on outside, but focus on becoming the best damn surgeon that you can, or best damn doctor that you can. And the financial stuff, if you're smart enough uh, and work hard enough to become a surgeon or a doctor, then the financial stuff, like maybe a little bit difficult to tackle initially, but you'll get the grasp pretty quickly. But that being said, like if you do have to start worrying about it, when should you? It's usually like your last year of training. That's when you're kind of really getting serious about it. Um, and you'll actually learn a lot about this stuff if you go for your interviews or you start researching. It's kind of like right now, like you guys have all these student forums about how do I excel on the MCAT? Or, um, you know, there's these residency forums for people that want to go into urology. Like, you know, that program just increased a spot. Like, oh, you know, like there's all these like secret societies. Um, so there's the same thing. There's like Facebook groups and other things that can teach you all these things. Um, but I wouldn't really worry about it right now. I would just focus on being the best doctor. Definitely. We talked about urology as a specialty and that's a residency on its own. In terms of the fellowships that has to offer post-residency, what are they? So I did a one-year fellowship in robotic microsurgery. Uh, that is where we use the robot to do very delicate, intimate surgeries on patients. And it's mostly it's for infertility and testicular pain. Um, the other more popular fellowships, there's a cancer fellowship, which could be one to two years. Now, when you hear one to two years, usually one year is like clinical fellowships where you're just doing clinical stuff, no research. Usually the two-year fellowships are, you know, you want to be a big time academic researcher or you're interest, interested in research and continuing it, then you do two years or you want to go to a big name program where it is two years, but you get that big name, you know, in your CV at the end of the day. So if there's oncology, there's um, uh, female urology where they just focus on like female stuff. Um, there's sexual dysfunction, um, which is like penile implants and low testosterone. Um, 
then there's endo urology, which just focuses on like kidney stones and like, you know, complex stone things and like minimally invasive procedures that can be done. And that's the top one. There's pediatrics um, as well. So I think that's the top ones. Um, I just, I just did a year, year and it was the best year of my life. So definitely. In terms of, you mentioned how you went to medical school early through a program, an early entrance program. Um, some students might not be too familiar with that. I know that there's some that will have students jump into the program right from high school. Others will start around their sophomore year. How did it work for you? How did you prepare for a program like that? So I didn't get into any of the programs that get you in right after high school. <laughs> I tried. Uh, I didn't get in. So yes, there's programs that you can apply directly um, from high school and then you're, you're set like, you know, six years, seven years, eight years, you're set. Um, if you do want to do one of those programs and it's six or seven years, I would highly advise you take a year off, either get an MBA or travel the world or do something like, don't just try to become a doctor quicker, like use that extra time that you have to do something meaningful and that will add value to you. Um, so that's right after high school. There are a select number of schools, I forget what they are, but you can, I'm sure you can Google them, like BU that have these early acceptance programs for their own students. Um, so I remember in the first meeting, there were like 400 plus people and then they ended up picking 12. So that was, it's still eight years, but my last two years of college, I started doing med school classes. So when I started med school the first year, like I had a lighter schedule. Um, so it's, it's out there um, to apply to, um, but it's not a necessity. You can still go the, the, the other route where you take the MCAT and apply afterwards. It's cool to get in early. It is. My GPA went from 3.9 to like after I got in, but it's okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. A lot of students think that it's just a relief. I, I know that there's some programs that will waive the MCAT. Um, like you mentioned, those programs that will have you uh, do it in a shorter span of time. It just feels like more of a relief because simply it's a short amount of time, but to your point, enjoy life while, while, it, while it comes, um, because each year is another opportunity to have uh, just a, a great time. Yeah, I, wanted I, to talk about I, I do think, I do think when you're a little bit older, mm -hmm. you will grasp medicine a lot, lot better. I think when you're super young and haven't kind of had life experiences, like it can be a little hard um, to grasp like that the side of medicine, which is the human side. And again, don't, I don't want people hating me on this, but I do think like, you know, people that are mature and have lived out there, I think they, they, it's, they have kind of hard, easier time kind of going out there in the real world. So we have a student asking, and I think you touched on this a little bit earlier about AI. Do you think that AI would change specifically the field of urology or surgery in general in your day-to-day -day life in the future? I think, I think AI is here to stay, man. We already see AI in some form when it comes to like how our EMR can kind of find things for us um, or auto-populate things. Um, I think it is coming, but it's going to take, I think, a generation before it becomes a standard. I think in urology, it's going to take some time. I think any surgical subspecialty where you have to use your hands, it's going to be very hard for like someone else to replace us. Um, for a long time. I mean, they've been talking about doing robotic surgery, using telemedicine from here to another country for decades, but are people comfortable with that just yet? I don't think so. Um, but I would say just off the cuff, I can think of a specialty that there is a lot of AI kind of being utilized um, in the research phases is radiology. So kind of identifying like differences between normal and abnormal. Um, and having these computer algorithms made that kind of um, help, you know, read imaging studies. So it's kind of, uh, it's very interesting, but it's also very scary at the same time. I see AI is there, but I see medicine more. I think the biggest change that we're going to have to kind of get used to, and some of us are used to it, I am, because I fully embrace it, is the partnership between MDs, DOs, and NPs and PAs. I think, you know, MDs and DOs are on the same level now. I mean, you know, generationally it wasn't, but now it is. APPs and, you know, PAs and NPs are coming in. 
And I think they're getting a lot more respect, which I, I know they deserve. And we're kind of more collaborative team members. I think you're going to see more APPs take over some of the, you know, some of the primary care portions of medicine or like the underserved areas of medicine um, more often. So you're going to have to kind of learn to work, work with that, work with that system. And in general, just broad scope, where do you think that the field of urology is headed in the future? Um, I mean, the cool thing about urology is that we're always, you know, 10 years ahead when it comes to technology. That's what I loved. Like when my first thing I saw at BU on my rotation was a robot taking out a prostate. Like, you know, there were other specialties that used the robot, but they didn't embrace it. Urology is like, oh, let's embrace this thing. When it comes to like laser technology and like even AI and like apps, like urologists can fully embrace it. So I think whatever technology is coming out there, I think urologists are definitely going to embrace it. But when it comes to like what I see coming out, I think we're going to see more different robots utilizing urology. We're going to see these robots do like things a little bit more automated. So, you know, like there's robots coming out that can, I can target it towards a stone and then it'll like fire the laser systematically at it. So it's kind of scary, but it, it is coming out there. I see um, uh, urologists kind of becoming a more integral part of men's health. Uh, and their overall wellness. Another student asks about just work-life balance. Um, there's quite a lot on your hands between surgery, surgery, clinical medicine, media, administration. Um, it seems like the influencers we see are supermen and superwomen that are balancing all of this all together. But to your point, we're all just humans in the end. So how do you make it work um, between your commitments and balancing time with family? It's interesting you ask this because I used to be really good at balancing it all and like being a part of it all. Uh, but I would say in the past year, actually me and my wife were talking about this, like um, uh, in the past year, it's been very hard to kind of do everything. Um, and it may be age, uh, but I think it's really, um, I'm much better at like knowing what's important in my life. And I know my family's way more important. Seeing my kids grow up is way more important it's easy to get caught up in the spotlight of, Oh, I'm on TV. And, you know, like I have a million followers on social media and, you know, I can give talks at conferences, you know, when we're gone, like there's gonna be someone else on the TV channel. Like, you know, the news people can be so flaky, like they'll call me consistently, but then I, I won't be able to do something and then they'll find another doctor, like, and then I'll be replaced. Like, so you're very replaceable, um, in those things. And all that spotlight is fleeting. Eventually the, you know, the electricity on it is no longer there, but what's always going to be there for you is your family. So I think I'm able to balance things um, much better, just knowing what my priorities are. Um, I think, you know, I don't always share this, but I think mental health is very important. I think I've had my personal mental health struggles, um, whether it's like just feeling down, seasonal affective stuff or, you know, anxiety, like, I don't really medicate myself, but I, I'm very aware of these things. And so um, I try to, you know, kind of have a fine balance that feeds what I need and my dopamine rushes, but also not overdo it. So for me, I do do a lot, but it's very strategic. Um, I think on social media, I make it look like I'm always doing these things, but everything is planned um, and everything has, you know, I, I would say my weeks and months are planned out. So I think if you plan accordingly, block out time it's it's very easy to do a lot of these things you know i just people think it's very hard but if you're focused um, i think it's very easy another student asks about what is your on-call days like uh, uh, on-call days kind of just depend on where you're practicing are you in a level one trauma center or are you in like a small community hospital you know where i'm at it's a level three trauma center so it's a community hospital we have um, a team member on the inpatient side that helps kind of see the consults and vet the, vet the consults. There's three of us. So we kind of divide and conquer and there's always someone in the operating room. So even though I'm on call, like, and my partner has time, like she'll just do the case. Um, at night, you know, I, again, it depends on how many doctors you have, how many days you have to cover ice. When one of our partners left, we were on call like every other week, but now we're on call once every four weeks. So life has gotten much better. Um, and it's just, 
you got to be available. Like there'll be weeks where I get no phone calls and there'll be weeks where I'm going in every single day. It's, it, it truly is random, but I'm going in less now as I get older because I know not everything is scary. Whereas when I started, everything was, Oh my God, I got to go in and do this. But now I'm much more confident in my skills. Um, and I don't go in as much because I can, I know how to manage things, um, you know, medically and stabilize the patient. Yeah. It makes things so much easier. And I think we all have steps in life like with undergrad jumping into college, it feels like a new experience. You're very tense and nervous about it. Once that confidence builds up and everything calms down, it's the same task, but you can do it much easier because those nerves are, are um, calmed down. So maybe I could just end with one more question. Uh, yep. We talked about specialties a lot in specific urology, but a little um, big picture in terms of medicine in general as a career choice. Medical schools are known for asking that question each year on personal statements. Why did you choose medicine? For you, what, what was the inspiration behind that? Um, honestly, when I wrote my essay, it was a very cliche thing. It was my dad always wanted to be a doctor and then couldn't do it. And my grandfather was a doctor and I wanted to like continue the family legacy. And I love medicine. And it was a very like, uh, um, kind of like a very strategically placed thing. So if you actually look at my essay, you're gonna be like, oh man, like it doesn't really portray why I did medicine. Um, it doesn't, you know, I um, really uh, stayed focused on medicine because my parents kind of, kind of really encouraged it. And I saw, uh, I hung out with a lot of family members that were physicians and I love like hearing stories of what they do in the operating room or what they do with patients. Like I always, I was always like, you know, some people like, you know, electronic stuff. Some people like cars. Like I was always attracted to like medicine. You know, my sister had bacterial meningitis. So she was in the ICU and I was very young. Um, and I don't give this moment much credit, but like she survived. And that whole experience of seeing through my, like, I think I was like nine years old, 10 year old, like the eyes of medicine. I think that stuck with me. I didn't know it stuck with me, but it stuck with me. And what I thought it was my parents pushing me, it actually turned out that it was that internal sentiment and they were just guiding me and it got me there. I did medicine because I love it. It's not a job for me. It's a passion. It's an extension of my life. And I truly, truly, truly just, I smile every single day when I have the opportunity to see patients. Um, so it's hard to kind of define. I actually, I have med students asking me all the time. I coach them on how to write essays and answer this question. I think it all has to be personalized to you it's much easier when you actually know why you're doing it. Definitely. I think that's a great place to land off today's episode. Thank you so much again, Dr. Brombat, for joining us. And thank you so much to our audience for tuning in. For our shadowers, just a, a quick last message. To earn credit for your attendance, if you're new to the system, you must pass the quiz to receive a certificate. We've posted that quiz in the chat box. It's also available under our virtual shadowing page. If you go on our website, scroll a bit down, to shadowing quiz, Dr. Brombot. That quiz will be due next week on Wednesday, July 13th at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. After passing that quiz, you're going to receive a certificate, um, which will be sent to the inbox of the email address you listed in the, on, on the quiz. You have to get at least 60% or higher on your first attempt. And just in case you don't find the certificate, just uh, send us over an email or check your spam folder just in case. We'll make sure that you get that over to you. For our next shouting session, we're going to, like I said, continue them Mondays and Thursdays. We're also gonna have one on Saturday next week. So Monday we'll have Dr. Kava um, on July 11th at 7 p.m. Central. That will be over anesthesiology. 14th at 7 p.m. Central again, we'll have Dr. Cosgrove anesthesia. And then on July 16th, Saturday, also at, 11, at 7 p.m. Central, um, we're going to have Dr. Sims for ob -JOIN. So we have quite a few episodes or quite a few uh, sessions, I should say, scheduled next week. And that's going to be continuing on. If you have any questions, like I said, feel free to reach out, uh, follow us on our Instagram page or subscribe to our listserv to stay in the loop. Um, for those who want to hear more from Dr. Brombot, do you want to plug in your Instagram? Yeah, I mean, Instagram, uh, I prefer LinkedIn if we're going to connect. It's... Uh... You can just search for Jamin Brombot, but all my uh, social media is slash DR Jamin B. Um, so yeah, definitely hit me up. And uh, this quiz you're getting, I did not write the questions. Michael did. 
So if it's hard, it's not me. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> but uh, all jokes aside, listen, I appreciate you guys. And, you know, look forward to kind of having you take care of me in the future. Thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to the next generation. So thank you so much, Dr. Brumbutt. And thank you again for 